Welcome back everyone to another Hearts of Iron 4 dub diary and this time we're going to take a look at the naval changes that have been uh, well announced uh, one of them two weeks ago and the other one half a week ago as of the making of the video and uh, yeah there's the first one that's about the ship designer and then the second one is about the naval treaties uh, which is very exciting so both of these are great um, just you know to summarize essentially the ship designer we're gonna take a look at that first so a new system has been put in place where you do not build ships anymore as a base right you do not research ships anymore as a basis you research hulls for for ships for example a cruiser hull or a battleship hull or a large ship i believe it is called or a small ship or destroyer hull so every hull has a limited number of slots in which you can fit modules and restricts what type of modules you can fit in it. So you fit modules that are, you know, weapons, uh, equipment of various kinds, systems that will uh, turn your hull into a ship. Okay, so that's pretty good. Um, so a destroyer, now called a light ship hull, can't mount heavy guns or airplane launchers, but it can mount depth charges, whereas a battleship, now called a heavy ship hull, can mount airplane launchers and heavy guns, but not depth charges. So this is what ensures that the different hulls actually have different, you know, classifications. These slots come in two favors, uh, fixed and custom slots. So the fixed ones are uh, ones that are just either always there like engines or they're just always one type of fitting um so for example all ships except marines have a fixed aa slot in that slot you can put either nothing or aa nothing else and obviously you know the reason why you wouldn't want that is uh maybe you want to save on the cost um so yeah Custom slots instead, you uh, can you can fill with whatever you want, or you know mostly whatever you want, and allows you to tailor a ship to a specific role as they're talking about. So yeah, you can see up here in the ship designer, what you're going to have is you're going to have a uh, sort of base lineup of stats in terms of um, speed, HP, uh, that are you know given by both the hull and the modules that you have fit on there and uh, then you have up there this is a destroyer hull you have in the top side all of the custom um custom slots and in the bottom side all of the fixed slots so the whole thing that you can do with it is they're talking about for example um if you want to specialize one type of destroyer to fight the uh, german u-boats then you're gonna pick a cheap uh, sort of uh, maybe obsolete hull because what it only needs to do is it needs to carry depth charges so you see that um, this is a relatively old-ish hull it is given a couple of depth charges it isn't given really heavy upgrades to its AA uh, fire control or torpedoes and its estimated production cost is 810 and there we go it's uh, relatively slow because it doesn't have the best engines because they say it doesn't have to be the fastest to catch a submarine and it just gets you know depth charges okay that that works then uh, in terms of an actual fleet destroyer they pick a more modern destroyer hull that can fit more modules at the top you can see so it fits dual purpose guns i think um that's mm, well, it fits more if more guns in general maybe dual purpose guns are a thing i do not know uh and more aa and more fire control and radar and all kinds of things that the other one didn't have uh of course this one doesn't seem to have no no, no okay it does have depth charges but as you can see, it has one depth charge attack as opposed to 21 up here. So this is the difference that, that makes. I guess every destroyer has a um, base anti-submarine attack. Uh, and as you can see, it also has much higher HP 
and uh, speed and range because it's a better hull and um, yeah essentially you you just get a better hull and you can see that it also tells you the uh, modifiers for the naval terrain uh, which is obviously pretty welcome I'm guessing that um, you know different modules will have different impact on different terrains which is not a bad thing at all and yeah uh, you can see that it also tells you how the difference uh, that whatever you're doing makes to the stats so it's a bit like the division designer in fact it's a lot like the division designer and I like it um, Unfortunately, miscalculated the Japanese are running swarms of cheap disposable destroyers with lots of torpedoes and not much else, using their carriers in a defensive role to provide air cover. So you design a light cruiser with plenty of guns to annihilate the destroyers before they can do too much damage. So yeah, uh, what they're kind of envisioning in it is uh, a kind of a back and forth, you could say, uh, trying to counter the enemy fleet design uh, with your fleet design, which is a bit uh, like what a lot of uh, 4X games do, and uh, the, the mostly focus on space usually. And yeah, I kind of like that. It's it's a good thing. It is kind of historical, and uh, yeah, it's great. And yeah, essentially, then you get to the big holes, right? Okay, so the big holes... Um, yeah, essentially, the big holes have a lot of different mechanics, and um, you can even refit them, which is going to come up in the second uh, Dev Diary, which we're going to talk about in a bit. And uh, yeah, essentially... Uh, like the way the ship designer is going to work is that they're trying to kind of limit obviously the ridiculous nature of uh, what you sometimes are able to achieve as a player you know gaming the system but obviously you know they, they can't really stop that too much and um, the system allows you to build a number of ship classes that have been requested a lot without any new subtypes a light carrier is just a carrier with fewer hangar modules and is thus considerably cheaper and an anti-aircraft cruiser is just a regular cruiser that mounts to a porpoise main guns now i wonder what they're gonna do with the torpedo cruiser which they added in uh, waking the tiger which uh you know <laughs> now just to do, to do a torpedo cruiser you're just gonna have to take a small cruiser uh hull and uh, put a bunch of torpedoes on it. <laughs> so yeah, that's uh, that's kind of derp. A seaplane carrier is a cruiser that dedicates most of its custom slots to airplane launchers, giving it free great surface detection at the cost of being bad at pretty much everything else. So a great thing about this ship designer is that you can do some pretty mm, creative, you could say, things with it and um, create kinds of ship design that are unorthodox, but in real life had to be done. For example, like if, we, if you go take a look at um, this ship, I hope I got the right one. I don't exactly remember which one. It, yeah, okay. So this this one, um, this one Japanese battleship, the Isa, eventually got reconstructed to be something like this. So they essentially took out a bunch of the guns on the back and put a sort of flight deck on it. It could launch seaplanes because obviously it, that that flight deck is not like large enough for you know an aircraft landing. So it became kind of a half battleship, half aircraft carrier. I hope that you can do something like this. And it seems like they're hinting that you can indeed do, you know, somewhere something somewhere along the lines of this. Yeah. Um, so you can heavily specialize certain ships to be in certain roles like, you know, scouting or uh, anti-submarine or anti-air, which is great. Uh, and yeah, so for some ship types, they've made special hull types. They give special capabilities. The Panzerschiff hull is available for Germany and is essentially a cruiser that mounts a single battleship grade heavy battery module. So yes, um, certain nations will still have special modules like the German Panzerschiff, and uh, the Nordic countries will get a coastal defense ship, which is slower than the regular cruiser, but can mount a battleship gun. That's historically accurate. Um, yeah, mm, I wonder if other countries will get like special things in some way or another, but yeah, I guess that depends on them. It's never bad. 
And uh, now the technology is essentially uh, work with the module system. So they're going to rework the naval tech tree, even though they don't want to show that yet. So uh, yeah, this is, they, they just kind of list the capabilities of the different hulls. So there's uh, the destroyer or light hulls. You know, they do a little bit of everything. The cruisers, they do a little bit of everything and then some. Then the heavy hulls are just, you know, they're strong, but they don't do too much. The carriers, uh, just they just have a couple of relatively okay things. And the submarines. Um, interesting enough, you can get the snorkel on a submarine. So that's going to be a late game tech, most likely. Um, yeah, so there's nothing really too strange in here, as far as I can tell. Uh, it's just pretty much what you'd expect. So, uh, the light hulls will carry a lot of weight to provide defense against submarines, but can also be turned into AA units or torpedo boats. So this is essentially like uh, a way to simulate what happens in real life with the destroyers, is that uh, they become kind of the warhorse of the fleets, because they're relatively cheap and uh, they can do a lot of things. You do not really need a cruiser to hunt a submarine, and it's nice to have a cruiser if you want to uh, defend your capital ship against enemy airplanes, but destroyers can do that as well. So yes, that's why destroyers end up being very, very important. Um, hopefully the AI of the ships in combat will be a little bit more uh, conservative with how it uses destroyers and it doesn't kill them outright, but whatever. Um, cruisers are meant to be very flexible and fulfill a, valuable, a vari variety of roles from being essentially big destroyers, uh, you know, destroyer leaders, which did exist in real life, such as, well, you could say the Atlanta class and a few British light cruisers were essentially meant to be uh, big destroyers. Um, with plenty of torpedoes and guns. Um, you know, plenty of torpedoes, you, you get into things like the Japanese Kitakami, um, and guns, obviously, the Atlanta, or the Brooklyn, for the Americans, to being the poor man's capital ship, and uh, so, like, for example, the Japanese Mogami, or uh, the American Northampton, if you know a few World War II ships, you should probably know these names, or being large, fast mine, later, mine layers. Battleships and battlecruisers are separated by different armor schemes and not much else, but with heavy armor being both labor and resource intensive, perhaps some corners can be cut. So essentially, um, you do not need to have separate uh, ship classes for these kinds, because the hull can be modified to be uh, any of those things, really. So that's fine. And then carriers. Uh, carriers are more flexible in terms of size, so obviously, you know, mm, that's meant to represent how you go from, like in 10 years, from the Langley to the Midway. Uh, and just to, like, just like make the comparison, let us look it up. I really should start, like, being a little bit more prepared for these videos. Like, this, this thing, you know, it's, it's like you can fit 10 biplanes on the flight deck to the USS um, Midway, which was launched right at the end of the Second World War. Although, uh, yeah, right, like this is after being refitted, but like the earlier one is like this, which is essentially like how many times the size? Probably a lot. So the, the length is 300 meters as opposed to this one, whose length is 165 meters. So it's double the length and uh, probably many times the tonnage. So yeah, massive, massive technological leap. And uh, not just in terms of size, but also in a lot of ways. So um, essentially, because you can build smaller carriers smaller nations can build carriers. Now, obviously, you run into a bit of a problem there, and uh, the problem is that the player has hindsight and knows that carriers are important, whereas countries didn't know that carriers would be important. So a lot of countries that might have been able to build a carrier, even with their technology, even just a small one, um, didn't do that in the actual war, but hey, who cares? Um, so 
I guess the player can benefit from hindsight, and even with like a medium to small naval power, such as, for example, the Netherlands, which is going to receive a focus tree, uh, you're going to be able to build a yourself a nice, maybe light to medium carrier uh, to be, you know, the bulwark of your fleet, and try to um, try to buff yourself up with that. And yeah, so submarines are still pretty much the same as you'd expect, and. Uh, Obviously, submarines can lay mines. Now, one thing that's really, really annoying that they didn't... Uh, maybe, maybe it's going to be a special for the Japanese is this motherfucker, uh, which was absolutely ridiculously impractical, but amazing. So this is a submarine, quote-unquote, aircraft carrier, uh, which could carry free, uh, uh, free sort of float planes, uh, seaplanes, and uh, they were really fucking big. Or another... Ah, uh, god damn it! I forgot the name. It was a French submarine. Yeah, this one. This French submarine is Recruf, which was like the second biggest submarine after the I four hundred. And uh, yeah, this one, this one was pretty damn big. You know, really, really big submarine. Except obviously it was built earlier and by France. So yeah. I don't know. Um, special submarines might be a cool thing, but they were never really a big thing in history, so yeah. Uh, While well, the ship designer window itself is going to be part of the DLC, the old naval tree you already know will simply unlock pre-scripted ship designs, and instead of the ship designer window, you get the variant uh, up regular variant upgrade screen that you're familiar with. So yeah, that's, you know, mm, relatively unfortunate. Assuming that the ship designer works out the way we hope it does, we hope to expand the system to cover tanks and airplanes as well. So, yeah, whatever. Um, overall, what I think is that it's really great. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't really say that I grew up playing games where you could do this kind of stuff because that would be ridiculous. But I did play, you know, in the past a lot of games where these kinds of uh, ship designers and, uh, you know, just in general, unit designers were a big part of the experience, and uh, yeah, I'm pretty damn happy that, to see that Hearts of Iron 4 is getting these, uh, because, I don't know, I think that they're just gonna open up a whole, you know, whole lot more variety in how you set up your fleet, and hopefully they're also gonna be very heavily moddable, so that, you know, uh, different scenarios can make different things work with this. So yeah, um, then there's the naval treaties, which is uh, a lot more uh, strategic. We, we get more to the strategic level of the world war, and uh, it's actually a very interesting topic. There's few things that we do not really have much time to talk about that would be much more interesting to talk about, but we're going to get into that. Uh, so, essentially, uh, ship design in the interwar years was heavily restricted by the Washington Naval Treaty and the first London Naval Treaty. Now, the Washington Naval Treaty is a little bit earlier. Let's, let's get to it. We've already talked about this a couple of times, so also known as the Firepower Treaty. This essentially was... Uh, it was signed right after, essentially, the end of the First World War. And so it was pretty much just a victor's treaty uh, to prevent a new um, arms race, kind of. And uh, it also it had two aspects, essentially. One was the limitations on ship design, which is what they're more interested in, kind of. But the more important one was the ratio system of capital ships. So the treaty kind of tried to um, tried to make sure that to prevent a new arms race, they didn't just need to limit the amount of things you could fit on a ship. So you know, essentially uh, because one parts of the one part of the arms race for ships is obviously that ships get more and more powerful as technology improves. And as countries try to one-up each other, designs end up getting quite ridiculous and expensive. So they try to limit that uh, to save money and resources. So they did that. Uh, another thing is obviously that you can just build more ships. So the bigger naval powers 
in the Washington Naval Treaty got uh, sort of their navy limited to a fixed ratio that uh, was expected was um, essentially fixed on the tonnage of capital ships of you know giving one the, I don't exactly remember what uh, number they fixed to be one but it was a fifth of what um, the British had and so they said okay so the US and the UK can both have five okay so the US and the UK can both be at about the same level then the Japanese can be at three and the French and the Italians can be at 1.75 um, now the essentially all of these players were relatively happy with this now why you might be saying well when you know the Japanese be mad that they can't get five well see the thing is if you look at the map um, of like how the <laughs> like how the, well you let's just go let's just go to Japan uh, if you look at a map you can see why because at the time oh wow well this is a new feature okay so essentially the world is round right uh, so the United States had to defend two oceans so it had to keep half its fleet in the Atlantic and half its fleet in the Pacific to s simplify go away um, so that five would be split between 2.5 in the North Atlantic keeping at bay you know the British or whoever and 2.5 in the Pacific that could threaten Japan so Japan's strategic thinkers think okay well we just need a navy that's you know in some ways bigger than the American fleet so that it can beat the half of the American Navy that's in the Pacific before the other Navy can arrive, which is essentially what they did to Russia in the um, in this uh, Russo-Japanese War. So they needed to have a Navy that was roughly 60% that of the United States, and so that's what pretty much what they got in the Washington Naval Treaty. For the British, it was probably even worse because at the time the British Empire had, you know, possessions in America, in the South Atlantic, in the Caribbean, in Africa, in India, obviously. So, you know, Britain was spread all over the place. So the Japanese had a similar reasoning for the British as well. They're like, okay, maybe they can keep half of their navy in Singapore and try to fight us. But if we have more than half of that, we're going to be happy. And essentially, it was a similar... Uh, similar line of thinking with the uh, Italians and the French because the Italians, the French, and the Japanese all had vastly inferior economies to Britain and France. It says over here, not sure about the source of this, so don't, you know, don't go around believing this 100%. I'd have to check, double check this. At the beginning of the negotiations, the Japanese had half the capital ships of the Americans, but only one fifth. Of the GDP and now this conference was in 1922 before the depression in the United States but also before the 1920s economic troubles of Japan so the naval treaties are coming around at a time when the major powers are starting to try to disarm because of the massive massive debt that they incurred in this first world war except for the Americans but the Americans they are also receiving back into isolationism due to political troubles, and then they have to deal with the depression later. So essentially, all these naval powers do not really have the financial or political will to really build up their navies in an arms race. So this is why these treaties come about, and they're important. And in 1936, you're having the London um, Naval Treaty being negotiated, which in the game is going to limit the amount of designer points or production costs that you can assign to a single ship hull, obviously depending on the hull type. So, you know, obviously large ships will have a, lo uh, a bit of a bigger uh, production limit than a cruiser. But yes, um, so essentially it's going to be doing that. I'm not sure if anyone's going to try to work in the ratio system but I don't know. I really do not know. Um, so the signatories of 1930 London Naval Treaty will start a national spirit that restricts the maximum cost of their capital ships. 
Um, so yeah, essentially, uh, yeah, they're they're talking about their thought process, which is like pretty standard. Um, and yeah, essentially, the way it is limiting is limiting the overall cost of the ship. So you're gonna have to specialize in one way or another. So maybe I don't know. Maybe you just want your ships to be a lot more offensively focused. Maybe you can upgrade the guns a little bit more than what you um, perhaps would be allowed, but then you take away some of the armor and so the production cost works out. Something like that. When you start the game in 36, you will notice a mission tickling now reminding you that the second level conference is currently underway. If you do not decide if you don't decide to bail, you will automatically sign the second London Naval Treaty. Building from the treaty is at first only available during the London conference and costs some political power, less for fascist nations. However, fascist nations can stay in the treaty and later decide to cheat um, using creative accounting to measure the true displacement of the ships, which is what the Germans did with the Bismarck. It's also probably what the Italians did with the Littorio, but I'm not 100% sure on this. So let me look it up really quick. I am pretty damn sure that this was quite in excess of the treaty. Uh, yeah, larger design should be pursued. I don't know. Yeah, prob probably a little bit overboard. Uh, although, well, okay. Uh, definitely is what the Japanese, however, did with, you know, most famously the Yamato class. So, yeah. Um, and also with a lot of their cruisers. So, yeah, okay. So you can choose, obviously, to abide by the treaty in some ways. And the reason for that is uh, that, like there's an escalator clause that they're that they talk about later. Essentially, once someone revokes the treaty, then the other countries get a uh, increase essentially on the on the tonnage of their ships. So that's the arms race building up. Um, so yeah, that's the incentive incentive for just cheating as opposed to just abandoning the treaties uh, altogether. And um, yeah, okay. So, as a fascist country, you therefore have an incentive to state the treaty, as it will restrict your opponents more than it restricts you while denying them the escalator clause. Now, it's worth mentioning that, obviously, uh, a little bit of an important thing is that Japan, Italy, and Germany economically were much weaker than the British, at least when it comes to shipbuilding. Uh, the Japanese economically as a whole were weaker, the Italians economically as a whole were weaker, and also their shipbuilding industry was weaker. And also, Ger uh, Germany was obviously, you know, on par with the UK economically, but it's, or in fact, was probably a little bit above. I don't exactly remember the numbers off the top of my head, but its shipbuilding was a lot more limited. So that's why they had an incentive to kind of at least try to play along with these treaties, because even if they tried to break them, they wouldn't have been able to reach the British anyway, because the British were prepared to spend inordinate amounts of resources to keep that navy uh, in a position of absolute supremacy, whereas countries like Germany simply couldn't afford that. If a country outside the treaty reaches a certain percentage of the British size and capital ships, they can be invited into the treaty. Uh, now, I'm not sure which country they might be thinking of, like maybe the Soviet Union might be the only one. Like, if they seriously expand the Soviet Union, maybe. Maybe Brazil, if they seriously expand. But, yeah, like, because the, the number that they're talking about is 80% of capital. Oh, no, okay. Uh, so, okay, now this is just disarming 80% of their capital ships. It, they're not... Okay, so that's a certain percentage. Okay, who knows which countries they have in mind for this. But yeah, um, should the nation decline and continue to expand their navy until near parity, the treaty nations can try to force them to disarm up to 80% of the number of capital ships. A refusal to disarm may lead to war. If the signatory nation exceeds the allocated amount of capital ships, they immediately get a mission to reduce the number of capital ships at the threat of a major stability loss. So yeah, um, this is quite great, TBH. 
Um, so, you know, especially like a refusal to disarm may lead to war because it's just such a British thing to do. It's like, you know, it's like, oh, you approach a certain amount of the capital ships that you are allowed, but you're above. So you're going to need to disarm or we're going to kill you. It's like, it's so very British. So you'll probably want to make sure you have the most capable ships as you can, as you are quite limited, sorry, in numbers as well as in size. So that's why if you look at uh, the ship numbers for capital ships in World War One, they're so much higher than before World War Two. At the same time, if you look at the way that um, naval technology was progressing before the Second World War, you see that quite a lot of innovations are adopted relatively quickly, and in fact a lot of the times, perhaps recklessly, by some of the major powers, especially the United States, because they're having to focus on quality rather than quantity. Um, so a lot of ships that normally would have just been you know, left around, they just get scrapped or converted into aircraft carriers. So yeah, that's pretty great. Um, and it's going to work pretty much in the same way in uh, Hearts of Iron 4 as we head on further down in the diary, we'll see. So essentially, um, yeah, the, you can convert ships, right? You Now you can convert ships and um, the conversion works with different mm, hulls, uh, rather, you can convert a hull to a different module combination for the same hull. And what you're paying for is the complete price of the refitted modules, plus a um, dismantling cost of the existing hull. So you're always paying more than if you would be bu uh, building a new ship. But at the same time, it's like, you know, you still have a way to uh, upgrade your standing fleet if maybe you cannot expand your fleet so that's the that's the that's the whole thing so it is usually uh cheaper to upgrade say from NTR level one to two than it is to reap out the rear turret and uh, put some in there so uh, actually that's talking about the conversion cost um yeah so for example converting uh one module to a different one costs more than simply upgrading the module to a newer version. And yeah, so this is just it. Um, and you can convert to different ship classes, for example, a cruiser to an aircraft carrier or a battleship to an aircraft carrier, which was, again, as we said, quite common. And yeah, um, then there's a new mechanic, which is the pride of the fleet, um, which is just like you design a ship, or rather you assign this award to one of the ships of your fleet, and it's just the pride of the fleet. It gives us some bonuses, and um, if it dies, people are mad. So yeah, that's about it. Uh, thank you all for watching, hope you've enjoyed, and I'll see you soon.